Hello, my name's Dr. Shaham Das. I'm a consultant forensic psychiatrist in London. I assess mentally disordered offenders. I also work as an expert witness, so I give evidence in criminal trials all across the UK. In June 2021, CrimeCon is coming to the UK. It will be full of experts such as myself and also law enforcement agents. They'll also be your favourite YouTubers and podcast makers. So I really hope to see you there. In the late 80s, Florida's cocaine imports were among the highest in the nation. Regional territories were enforced with intimidation and murder. One dealer bowed to no one, not even law enforcement. Desperate to stop the violence, authorities turned to the FBI for help. A suspected drug dealer would stop at nothing to keep local and federal authorities from building a case against him. When his organization started targeting the government itself, federal agencies went on high alert. I'm Jim Kallstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. He was a desperate man, driven to desperate measures. Bringing him down would take the combined efforts of the DEA, the ATF, and the FBI. Fort Myers Beach, Florida, July 18, 1987. It was a Saturday night in a Gulf Coast beach town with a thriving nightlife and a booming drug trade. Away from the tourists, many local residents spent the weekend at private parties. For some, that included cocaine. At one party, several men waited for their friend to return with more drugs. He'd been gone for about a half an hour when they heard what sounded like gunshots at around 10 p.m. The owner of the car, whose vehicle was used for the drug run, saw that it was now parked out front. Inside, he found his friend shot to death. The Lee County Sheriff's Department responded to the scene. A forensic technician found only one identifiable fingerprint on the car. It belonged to the vehicle's owner. Lying close to the driver's door were seven empty 22 caliber shell casings. Investigators determined the victim had been shot at close range. An autopsy would reveal eight bullet wounds in his upper body and traces of cocaine in his bloodstream. The owner of the car said the dead man was his friend, 29-year-old Craig Karen. Reluctantly, he told homicide detectives that the victim had left earlier to buy cocaine. The victim's girlfriend suggested police should question her boyfriend's cocaine dealer. He owed the dealer money for drugs. The dealer had a reputation for violence. Lee County homicide detective Tom Continos learned the dealer's name was Jeff Saganek. Jeff is a young kid from Fort Myers Beach who had established himself as what I thought to be a, a mid-level drug dealer on the beach. Through talking to Craig's associates, I learned that Craig owed Jeff a large amount of money. 
And the reputation was that you better pay your bills with Jeff or he's going to send someone to collect it. The next day, an unexpected visitor appeared at the Lee County Sheriff's Department. It was the alleged cocaine dealer himself, 23-year-old Jeff Zaganik. He asked to see the detective investigating the previous night's killing. He wanted to give a statement. The reputed dealer, with a history of arrests, heard he might be a suspect and wanted to set the record straight. On the night of the murder, Jeff Zaganik claimed that he and his girlfriend were at a restaurant for a late dinner. He said that he had talked to the victim in the parking lot just before the couple sat down to eat. After a few minutes, the man left. The reputed dealer said he and his girlfriend were at the restaurant from about 9.45 until 11 p.m. And he had more to offer than his word. Jeff Zaganik handed the detective his restaurant receipt. The waitress who served them confirmed the story. It appeared he had an airtight alibi. But to the seasoned detective, it seemed Jeff Zaganik was trying too hard to cover his tracks. I had investigated enough homicides to see it all different types of suspects and, and how they react and the reasons why they commit murder. For this young kid to come in, as well organized as he was, with an alibi, with witnesses, with receipts, he became my number one suspect. On a tip, the detective questioned a member of a local rock band who was also known to deal cocaine. He admitted that the victim sometimes bought drugs from him directly, which made Jeff Zaganik, allegedly the largest dealer on the beach, angry over the lost sales. At about 11.15 on the night of the murder, Jeff Zaganik came to the lounge where he was playing. According to the performer, Jeff Zaganik boasted that he had just had the victim wasted and that it would teach the people of Fort Myers Beach a lesson. The musician's story was one of many over the next several months that confirmed what police already suspected. But even in the underworld of Fort Myers Beach, rumors and innuendo were not evidence of murder. Everything that I got was hearsay. No one would really give me sworn testimony that says, I saw this or I saw that, or I know this and I know that. It was all he said, she said type of intelligence information which is maybe okay for drug cases, but not with murder investigations. You need sworn testimony of people who actually saw something happen. Okay. Then in the summer of 1988, over a year after the murder, the detective finally got a break. A young woman came forward claiming to have witnessed the killing. She had not spoken up sooner because she was addicted to drugs and was protecting her former supplier, Jeff Zaganik. Craig Karen. He had it hidden. Now she was clean and wanted to tell detectives what she had seen on the night of July 18, 1987. But when he told me to go. She was on her way to the cocaine party that evening when she witnessed the shooting. The gunman was her former boyfriend, a man who worked for Jeff Zaganik. But the detective would be unable to speak to her boyfriend directly. Just a few months after the murder, her boyfriend had committed suicide. She told police that she also had direct knowledge about Jeff Zaganik and his organization. The woman said Jeff and his right-hand man operated out of a local pizza parlor that Zaganik owned. 
The dealer stored his drugs and money at several different locations and moved between them to avoid detection. Few people knew where he actually lived. Jeff Zaganik had many people on his payroll, but she knew only a handful. Her former boyfriend was one of them. Hired by Jeff Zaganik to do whatever the dealer needed done. She and Jeff had also had an arrangement. In exchange for storing drugs and guns at her apartment, Jeff had paid her rent. Unable to corroborate her story with other testimony or physical evidence, the detective could not charge Jeff Zaganik with the murder. I followed up on those leads, and I was not able to substantiate any of the information that she gave me at that point. So without the trigger man, without a gun, without eyewitness testimony, I couldn't get to Jeff. I couldn't get to Jeff. I had no physical evidence, no testimonial evidence, that enabled me to bring charges against Jeff. The homicide detective looked to the Lee County Narcotics Unit for help. Detectives began surveillance on Jeff Zaganik's pizza party, hoping to identify someone they could turn against the dealer. The place was a popular spot. It would take time for officers to discern the drug traffickers from the legitimate customers. To complicate matters, Jeff Zaganik changed his name legally to Jeff Matthews, presumably to sever ties to his past crimes. Jeff was the type of person where he wanted to be a clean-cut businessman. Jeff even went to the point of changing his name from Jeff Saganik to Jeff Matthews to try and help him with his reputation. Over several weeks, investigators noted which people frequented Jeff Matthews' place without picking up any food. Investigators spotted one man who visited often. A license plate check revealed his name was Stephen Franken. Detectives speculated that Franken might be their connection to Jeff Matthews. Investigators called DEA Special Agent Dennis Bolam, who was already familiar with Stephen Franken. Agents believe Franken was a low-level cocaine dealer who procured his supply from Jeff Matthews, but they had no proof. To link the two men, Agent Bolam hoped to use an informant close to Franken. I received some information uh, from a cooperating source uh, that he, uh, Mr. Franken was distributing uh, cocaine out of his house on uh, Hibiscus Street in uh, Fort Myers Beach, and that um, he uh, was distributing to quite a few people down at the Fort Myers Beach area. Their informant, recently arrested for possession, was one of Stephen Franken's biggest customers. For his cooperation in controlled drug buys from Franken, the informant would receive probation. If the purchases were successful, agents would be able to arrest Franken then press him for direct testimony about Jeff Matthews and his organization. Stephen Franken was important to the investigation. He had quite a bit of knowledge as far as uh, drug trafficking that was taking place down at uh, Fort Myers Beach and with Jeffrey Matthews' uh, participation in this drug trafficking. The informant returned with cocaine. After several more buys, DEA agents finally had what they needed to make an arrest. On August 25th, 1988, agents secured a felony arrest warrant for Stephen Franken for the sale and distribution of a controlled substance. Once Franken was in custody, agents searched his house 
Inside, they found prepackaged cocaine, scales, and cash. In exchange for a shorter sentence, Franken agreed to cooperate with agents. He admitted that murder suspect Jeff Matthews was his cocaine supplier and consented to say so in front of the grand jury. Franken was released on bond until then. As investigators continued to hunt for evidence in their case against Matthews, deputies in nearby Collier County, Florida, responded to a crime scene. On October 2nd, 1988, a surveyor had discovered fully clothed, skeletonized human remains in a rural dump site. It appeared the body had been there for the past several weeks. Though there was no wallet or other ID, detectives did notice a paper bracelet on the victim's wrist, similar to those used by hospitals and nightclubs. Investigators gathered dental records from local families who had recently reported their loved ones as missing. They hoped one of them would match the unknown victims. The dental records, along with the body, were sent to the medical examiner for comparison. He first determined that the victim was a white male in his 20s, killed execution style with five 38 caliber bullets to the head. From the body's wrist, the M.E. removed the paper bracelet. He confirmed it was an admission ban from a nightclub in Fort Myers Beach. Dental records from a missing 22-year-old man last seen leaving the club confirmed that the murder victim was Thomas Sellers. Collier County Sheriff's detective visited Seller's father to give him the bad news. Questions in reference to that. Um, has he been doing any legal activities or hanging around anybody lately? That, uh, the father told the detective that his son had a cocaine problem and believed the young man owed his dealer, Jeff Matthews, $1,000. It was also rumored that his son was last seen leaving the club with a man reputed to be a hitman for the dealer. But once again, investigators were unable to find evidence to corroborate the rumors. Do you have any pictures of your son? Agents and detectives' only direct witness to Matthew's operation was Stephen Franken, a low-level dealer arrested months earlier. They hoped his grand jury testimony would be enough to arrest a cocaine supplier suspected of ordering two executions. On January 27, 1990, as the DEA and Lee County, Florida sheriffs continued to pursue suspected cocaine dealer and murderer Jeff Matthews, detectives received a call about another possible homicide. At around midnight, a man was unpacking boxes in his new home when he heard the sound of a car squealing towards his house. The vehicle didn't stop until it reached his backyard. Inside, the driver was dead. Lee County Detective Tom Continos was one of the first to arrive at the home in St. Carlos Park. Initially, I was told it was a motor vehicle accident. There is a dead body in the car. and. The closer I looked, the more I realized that he didn't die from a car accident, he died from a bunch of bullet holes. A driver's license found on the victim identified the dead man as 22-year-old Stephen Franken, the primary witness scheduled to testify against drug kingpin Jeff Matthews at a grand jury hearing just two days away. It seemed Matthews was aware that without Franken's testimony, Investigators wouldn't have enough evidence to bring an indictment against the cocaine dealer, suspected in two killings and now a third. 
according to DEA Special Agent Dennis Bowen. I think the timing of the murder was because of the timing of the grand jury, the information we received as far as uh, Jeffrey Matthews being involved in, in other shootings and murders at Fort Myers Beach, and um, that uh, Stephen Franken had some valuable information as far as uh, Jeffrey Matthews' drug operation. But now the grand jury would never learn what Franken knew about Matthews. The federal witness was likely dead before he crashed. Detectives decided to search the surrounding area to determine where the shooting had taken place. Something happened before the guy hit the house or else he wouldn't have driven through the house. Um, so I walked down the dirt road about um, several hundred yards um, and I found what looked like some attempt at a roadblock. Large and small branches covered the road, strewn by what must have been a vehicle. To the left side of the site, detectives found several 22 caliber shell casings, the same caliber as the bullets later removed from Stephen Franken's body. Footprints, as well as tire impressions from a separate vehicle, were discovered close by in the loose dirt. Technicians made plaster casts for later comparison should a vehicle or suspect be located. From their placement in Franken's wounds, officers determined that the shooter had fired at the driver's side of the car. My immediate thoughts were that someone had constructed this roadblock to slow a car down, slow the car down enough where someone can jump out of some brushy area that, that's along both sides of the road and shoot the person driving that car. The gunman must have known when Franken left work and the route he traveled home. The victim probably stopped briefly when he saw debris in the road just long enough for the shooter to take accurate aim. Clinging to life for a few more moments, he likely accelerated down the road and into the house. Though suspected murderer and drug dealer Jeff Matthews was believed responsible, investigators were once again left with no direct evidence tying Matthews to the crime. The fact that Stephen Franken had been a federal witness enabled authorities to broaden the investigation to include the U.S. Attorney's Office and the FBI. Together, they needed to develop a strategy to snare Jeff Matthews and put an end to the violence. Retired Special Agent Guy Nottley was part of the team. The FBI immediately started working with the Lee County Sheriff's Office and the Drug Enforcement Administration. There was nothing done without the, telling the other agency involved that what was going on. Uh, the FBI did have a lot of manpower that they could put on this matter. They did have uh, tremendous ability for the technical aspect of the investigation. They knew Matthews was still operating in the area, but the dealer was well insulated. The only way to get to him was through his drug operation and employees. But after the informant Franken was murdered, finding someone else to cooperate would be no easy task. What made it so difficult was that we didn't have a lot of people come forward and uh, voluntarily uh, supply information on uh, Jeffrey Matthews. Uh, most of the people knew that he was capable of committing murders and uh, they were intimidated by him. Agents turned to a man behind bars whom they believed had been an insider in Matthews' organization. Serving a 10-year sentence on concealed weapons charges, the Fort Myers Beach, Florida man was reputed to be one of Matthews' former hitmen. He agreed to tell what he knew about the dealer's drug operation in exchange for a shortened sentence. Just before his arrest, the alleged hitman admitted that Matthews had ordered him to surveil Stephen Franken to learn the man's schedule. With that information, Matthews would be able to silence Franken before he could testify against him. 
The convict denied knowing who actually pulled the trigger since he was behind bars before the murder took place. He did tell investigators about another unsolved homicide he claimed that Matthews had committed. He said that one night at the pizza parlor, a contractor was repairing the tiles on the kitchen floor after the restaurant closed. Yes, the sounds. The hitman had brought over a new silencer for Matthews' gun. No one's gonna hear anything. No one hear anything. I think. See the way. It's a heavy gun. Yeah. Look at that. Yeah. How's that? Nice target. He claimed the drug lord killed the contractor just to test the silencer. Agents hoped to get Matthews to corroborate the hitman's stories. The convict agreed to call Matthews to set up a recorded meeting. He asked Matthews to come by the prison to drop off some new music tapes. Matthews agreed. All right. Agents would be ready to record the conversation on audio and video, hoping Matthews would incriminate himself. We received approvals from uh, the U.S. Attorney's Office as well as the jail to install these recorders. Then, uh, after we installed everything, uh, he never did show up. Jeffrey Matthews is very elusive, uh, surveillance conscious. He insulated himself pretty well. Even his closest friends didn't know where he was residing at. Matthew's last suspected victim may have known. But because he was silenced, the alleged murderer remained free and was becoming more desperate. By early 1990, the FBI, DEA, and Florida authorities continued to pursue suspected drug lord and murderer Jeff Matthews. Since 1988, he had been implicated in four executions in the Fort Myers Beach area. For Lee County homicide detective Tom Continos and dozens of agents, a lack of hard evidence and verifiable witness statements kept Jeff Matthews just out of reach. Two years have gone by and I still couldn't get my hands around Jeff Matthews. There was nothing there for me to to follow up on. It was dead end after dead end after dead end. Um, all the time I knew Jeff was my number one suspect and he was getting stronger and stronger and bolder and bolder on his criminal activities on, on the beach. And it was very frustrating. On February 12, 1990, a judge agreed that investigators had enough circumstantial evidence against Matthews to search the dealer's pizza place the likely headquarters for his operation. They served the warrant after hours to avoid endangering customers. From the restaurant, investigators seized documents, phone records, and bank and credit card statements. also confiscated Matthews' Trans Am. The tire treads were compared to impressions found at one of the murder scenes. The results were negative. Upstairs from the pizza parlor, investigators searched an apartment where Matthews was rumored to sometimes stay with his girlfriend. The couple was not there, nor did the searchers find any cocaine but they did recover silver tip 357 cartridges. 35 caliber cartridges. 22 calibers. Cash, additional phone records, and most importantly, 22 caliber bullets. The same caliber used in at least three of the four executions. They were sent to the crime lab to be compared with the spent 22 caliber rounds retrieved from the victims. Tests of the bullet's metallurgic composition did not reveal any matches. It was one more dead end in a grueling case. Though there was no direct evidence linking the alleged drug dealer to the murders, D. 
DEA Special Agent Dennis Bolam and his team believe they had enough to indict Jeff Matthews and several associates as part of a continuing criminal enterprise. We had concerns at that point that by leaving him out on the street, he could commit additional uh, murders. So uh, we, we felt we had sufficient evidence at that point, and that uh, that's the reason why we went and got the indictments uh, to go pick him up. But Matthews was nowhere to be found. Friends and associates claimed that he had left Fort Myers for parts unknown. His girlfriend, also named in the indictment, agreed to cooperate with investigators to help locate the fugitive. Through a tapped phone line, she made contact with Matthews on his cell. Hello? Hey, it's me. Hey. The suspected murderer where refused to say where he was. Don't worry about where I am. Kind of hard to get to she told him she was worried about the indictments. If I find out who ratted on us, I'm gonna kill him. Matthews You're vowed that he would find yeah. out who was talking to authorities and kill them, hey, plain me. and simple. Yeah. He hung up seconds later. The next day, a confidential informant gave Lee County homicide detectives a promising tip. They learned that Matthews had rented a car, the borrowed credit card, on the night Stephen Franken was murdered. Here's a picture. Can you tell us a little bit about the case? An evidence technician compared the tire treads from the rental car to a plaster cast of the tracks collected at the scene of the ambush. They matched. It was the first hard evidence linking Matthews to one of the four murders. Unfortunately, it didn't prove that Matthews had driven the rental car to the crime scene, nor that he had pulled the trigger. We were trying to gather as much information about Matthews as we could. We weren't in, even successful in finding out where this guy lived. We heard he lived in this big house. We heard he lived in that big house. He drove this car, he drove that car, but he was never there. We were never able to pin him down to a, where he lived. We only knew that he drove one car and that's a black Trans Am. Um, he was like, you know, he was everywhere but nowhere. Then on the night of March 16th, 1990, Lee County detectives responded to a call from the home of a Fort Myers Beach fire inspector. A pipe bomb was thrown into his driveway. Filled with 38 caliber bullets, the explosion sent ammunition and shrapnel ripping through the inspector's car and house. It also damaged a storage shed in a neighboring home. No one was injured. The inspector said he had no idea who might be responsible. Detectives asked him for a list of businesses that had failed any recent fire inspections. You any problems with anybody? One name I, uh, stood out. Jeff Matthews. I responded to that scene, learned that this fire inspector conducted a fire inspection of Matthews' restaurant and did not give him a very good uh, write-up as far as the fire conditions of the restaurant. Once I heard that, I said, this is Jeff sending this guy a message. But if it was Matthews, he had left no trace. All police had to go on was the spotty testimony of a neighbor. The neighbor had heard tires squeal just before the explosion. When he looked outside, he saw a white hatchback race away. It had been too dark to see the license plate. If Matthews had been involved, Detective Contino's pondered his change in tactics. I remember thinking that was a significant change in Jeff's operation. Before he was targeting other drug dealers. Now he's targeting government officials, being that he was a Fort Myers Beach fire inspector. That is something different that Jeff was doing. The detective returned home well after midnight. He tried to unwind, hoping to get some sleep. At about 2 a.m., the sound of an explosion sent him rushing to the window. 
that sound like a transformer blowing up, a car backfiring, fireworks. I mean, there's a number of things that happen in my neighborhood that that sound could possibly occur. Phone rings two or three minutes later. It's one of my uh, associates um, who's yeah, on the DEA Regina. task force says, Tom, the DEA building just got blown up. The Fort Myers DEA office was moments away from the detective's house. I'm the first one on the scene, and I saw the entire DEA building engulfed in flames that are hundreds of feet high. I mean, it was just, it was an incredible sight for me. Investigators immediately suspected fugitive Jeff Matthews. It was the first bombing of a DEA office in U.S. history. 30 firefighters battled the blaze for almost an hour. Dozens of agents, U.S. Marshals, and deputies from six neighboring counties were also called in to help. FBI Special Agent Guy Nottley was among them. When I arrived on the morning of the bombing, on uh, March 17th, uh, DEA agents informed me that the suspect in this matter was most likely an individual that they indicted uh, two days before at Jeffrey Matthews. If this was the work of Jeff Matthews, the cocaine dealer's violence had escalated to horrific proportions. When law enforcement becomes the target, no one is safe. And Matthews was still on the run. On March 17, 1990, two days after the federal grand jury indicted suspected drug lord and murderer Jeff Matthews, the DEA office in Fort Myers Beach, Florida was firebombed. Agents suspected Matthews was responsible, but he was still at large. The FBI and Lee County Detective Tom Continos believed the fugitive was also the prime suspect in another bombing that occurred just hours earlier. We realized that in all likelihood that the pipe bomb at the fire inspector's house was a diversionary tactic to pull law enforcement resources away from the patrolling area of the DEA building in order for Matthews to firebomb the DEA office. By dawn, all that remained of the building was a burned out shell. Investigators now began the task of assessing what was left, how it happened and where the evidence was buried, hoping to identify the perpetrator. FBI Special Agent Guy Nottley called in specialists from headquarters. We brought in bomb technicians from our laboratory in Washington, D.C., as well as some FBI agents uh, from the Tampa Division uh, to conduct an investigation. The investigation consisted of going through all the debris that was left at the site, basically by taking it through a shovel and, and sifting through till we found out what incendiary device that's used. They determined that the fire was caused by a pipe bomb taped to two five-gallon gas cans and tossed through a window. It landed in the office of DEA agent Dennis Bolan. He believed the aim was no coincidence. My feeling is, is Jeffrey Matthews was trying to destroy the evidence in the case, and I had um, the case files um, on the Jeffrey Matthews case in, in a file cabinet right near the window, and uh, amazingly, the, the fire uh, and the explosion went right past it, and uh, everything was intact uh, as far as tape recordings and, and, and notes and, and so forth. Because of the early hour, no one was injured but damage was estimated at $4 million. Through scattered witness accounts, investigators pieced together a possible scenario for the bombing. No one knew how many people were involved. But neighbors heard only one car and one door open and close. Investigators figured those responsible stopped close to the building for a quick hit and run. The bombing had a profound effect on area law enforcement. Agents struggled to deal with the physical reality of the destruction and their emotional reactions. 
was shocked and then uh, I was angry. And then I was more determined to get him at that point than anything. It's changed my life because I, I didn't have 24 hour uh, guard on my house, as well as the other agents and the prosecutor in the case. Um, I had uh, a wife and, and two small children that I had to worry about, and um, they had to be protected. And, and I knew that uh, he was still running around out there and that uh, there's a possibility that he could do this again. FBI lab examiners inspected the remnants of the bomb. Nails used as shrapnel were packed into a metal pipe five inches in diameter with a unique threading and surrounded with gunpowder. Duct tape held the pipe between two five-gallon tanks of gasoline that helped to spread the fire when the bomb went off. One hundred DEA agents joined the team, and the four-person FBI office grew to more than 50. Investigators began tracking down where the bomb materials may have been purchased. Teams of agents canvassed every hardware store and gas station for miles around. The pipe used in the bomb had a unique threading. Agents found the store clerk who had sold this unusual item just days before the explosion. The clerk identified Matthews as the customer who had purchased it. Agents asked dozens of gas station employees if they remembered anyone purchasing gas in two five-gallon tanks during the past week or so. One remembered that a man fitting Matthew's description had done so recently. The evidence was mounting against the bomber, but agents still had no idea where he was. They interviewed his friends and associates to determine with whom he'd been in contact. Jeffrey, don't you? And how do you know Jeffrey? One told them that he had written to her, begging her not to believe what she read about him in the newspapers. But she had believed the articles and agreed to have her phone monitored so agents might trace a call from Matthews. Well, that would be great. You'd be willing to do that? Think you could help us? He was elusive. Um, we never knew where he would be at any given time. He was always on the move. So. Uh, uh, we utilized a trap and trace. Um, uh, we knew that he utilized a, a cell phone, and we were trying to zero in exactly where he was. With a signed affidavit, agents went to the company that handled Matthew's wireless account. If there was a hit on a cell tower from his phone, authorities would be alerted. They discovered he was still in Florida. We had even aerial surveillances set up in the uh, Orlando area where we found out where his cell phone was coming from to see if when we, he made a call that we could get people there quickly uh, in an attempt to uh, apprehend him. But agents were unable to trace Matthew's calls closer than a two mile radius. Then investigators received the tip they were hoping for. They raced to a Fort Myers storage facility where the manager had recognized Matthews from the media. Fugitive was presently unloading a truck there. Agents hoped they could get there before the suspected murderer and bomber escaped again. In the spring of 1990, FBI agents raced to arrest 26-year-old fugitive Jeff Matthews, suspected in four murders and the bombing of the Fort Myers, Florida DEA building. A team of agents responded to a call from a storage facility manager who had seen the wanted man on his property. Run around. Agents approached the suspect, ready to use deadly force. They removed his wallet to check his ID. Okay. The man was not Jeff Matthews. After two years of pursuit, Lee County, Florida detective Tom Continos was disappointed, but not discouraged. I just knew that at some point, we were gonna get him. He was too active, he was too violent. What concerned me was at what cost before we got him.
We just didn't know how long it was going to take and how many dead people it was going to take for us to get there. That was my concern. Is this where you kept the stuff? Yes, sir, it is. All right, thank you. Investigators received a tip from a realtor who claimed to have rented a house to Jeff Matthews before he was a known fugitive. They found common items, including duct tape and hardware store bags that might be linked to the bombing. Then they came across something that seemed clearly connected to Matthews' crimes. As DEA Special Agent Dennis Bolam recalls. There was a note, and uh, the note was addressed to the Lee County Sheriff's Department. I don't know the exact verbiage that was, was used in it, but it, it's something to the effect that, catch me if you can. Catch me as you want. Investigators sharpened their resolve to find him before anyone else was killed. On April 9, 1990, Matthews called his friend's tapped phone. Agents were prepared to strike if the woman could keep him on the line. This time he was calling from a payphone, according to FBI Special Agent Guy Nottley. We were able to determine that uh, he was in the Orlando area. Agents were sent to uh, different quadrants where they could be within 10 or 15 minutes of different pay phones that we thought maybe Matthews was using. Field agents waited for the word as precious seconds ticked by. The woman asked him where he was, but Matthews was anxious to hang up. Despite his best efforts, they got the trace. Agents set out to apprehend him before he vanished again. Our, uh, People were able to put a location on where the phone call was coming from. Agents were only about 5 or 10, 15 minutes away. They arrived at the scene. Uh, he was still talking when the agents arrived. FBI, you're under arrest. Show us your hands. Show us your hands. After almost three years of pursuit, investigators arrested Jeff Matthews without incident. To avoid the death penalty, Jeff Matthews pled guilty to supervising a continuing criminal enterprise, committing homicide to further that enterprise, cocaine trafficking, and bombing a federal building. On July 31, 1990, Matthews asked to speak to DEA and FBI agents. He said they needed to move on something right away or more innocent people would surely be killed. The convicted killer had a storage unit in Gainesville, Florida, loaded with explosives in a booby-trapped van. Agents immediately notified the bomb squad. I had concerns that he may be trying to set us up. Maybe have his uh, last hurrah before he went away to jail and uh, that we might be sending some agents into a, a real a dangerous situation. As Matthews had described, agents found a red van parked inside a storage unit rigged to explode. A bomb squad defused the devices and secured the area. With the booby trap rendered harmless, investigators quickly removed the dozen pipe bombs they found in the van. They also recovered an AR-15, a Mac-10, a Mac-11, and a 22 caliber handgun with a silencer. There was a rubber mask, Halloween mask. There was police raid jackets. There was additional bombs, bomb making equipment, manuals on how to make bombs, how to make booby traps, fuses and, and equipment to, to make bombs, including pieces of pipe, piping and timers and, and so forth. Matthews also told investigators where they could find the body of the contractor murdered in his pizza parlor more than two years earlier. Though Matthews claimed that his hitman had done the actual killing. Matthews said he and the hitman had carried the body in a freezer to the house Jeff was renting and buried the victim nearby. It was the same house where investigators had found Matthews' taunting note. They located both the freezer and the body, 
just where the killer said they would be. For this crime, Matthews pled guilty as an accessory. Drug dealers just don't start off a business by killing people. Um, and most of them don't kill people. But, but Jeff was a very violent, um, organized person. And that made him dangerous. And that made him even harder to catch. On October 1st, 1990, 26-year-old Jeff Matthews was sentenced to 100 years in prison without the possibility of parole. He will never again be free to terrorize the people of Fort Myers Beach, Florida.